confident and very competent character that we've seen previously. So it's fooling nobody. There were recordings of him within the prison system and we discovered that in fact when he wasn't being watched as far as he believed, he would play chess um, very avidly with a number of the prison guards and was successful on most occasions. And yet as soon as he knew there was a prison visit, whether from a scientist or other, um, imminent, he would then revert to a different form of behaviour. And we were able to demonstrate this to those who were defending and so that issue went away as a trial issue. The trial was set for court number one at the Old Bailey. Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr stood just a few feet apart but barely acknowledging the other's presence. Ian Huntley pleaded not guilty to the murders of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. Maxine Carr pleaded not guilty to perverting the course of justice and not guilty to assisting an offender. I'd been in the Old Bailey many times. With this time, for the very first time, I was put in the witness box. As the trial progressed, the prosecution would use TV footage of Ian Huntley to make its case. Not just his interviews, something else. In the background, and we studied the motor car that he had used with very great care and that gave one of the most significant clues in the end. The Old Bailey's famous court number one. The trial for the murders of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. Two 10-year-old girls who disappeared off the street in their home village while on their way to the sweet shop. Charged with their murder, Ian Huntley, a local caretaker. He pleaded not guilty. His now ex-girlfriend, Maxine Carr, pleaded not guilty to perverting the course of justice and to assisting an offender. The prosecution studied every frame of the television coverage and found something unexpected. We spent a good deal of time studying not just Ian Huntley on the screen, but the surrounding information that was there. And most importantly, amongst that was his motor car. A team of forensic enhancers analysed every feature of Huntley's car. We were absolutely convinced that he must have taken the children from his home in the car. And so we were, as it were, looking blind for anything about the car. They looked at blow-up images of the rugs on the back seat, the parcel shelf, and then hit the jackpot. On screen, we were able to establish uh, one fact particularly, which was that there had been a change of tyres on that car, and it must have happened very soon after the killing of the two children. And our theory at the time was that he had killed the children, taken them to the burial site, and then returned. But as part of his forensic clean-up, had done what he could to alter the appearance of the car so that it was a clean vehicle. The drive to where Huntley would conceal the bodies near RAF Lakenheath had taken him off road. He feared the marks on his tires would be suspicious, so he swapped them. The surface was quite unusual. It had been laid over a period of different strata, and so one would have expected all sorts of materials, including um, shale and shells um, from very historic times to have appeared in the tread of the tyre. What in fact we did find in due course when studying the car was that on one of the suspension arms in particular there was a small trace left from the, the track down to the burial site and that small trace had every single strata layer of the road surface. Faced with overwhelming evidence, Huntley finally did admit that Holly and Jessica had died in his home, but accidentally. Holly had drowned in the bath after a nosebleed and he, Huntley, had mistakenly strangled Jessica. Huntley's defense was, well, if it hadn't have been so gruesome and we weren't talking about the lives of two young girls, it would be laughable. So we're to believe that Holly a very healthy 10-year-old would develop a nosebleed and then fall into a bath and die 
it's, it's just ludicrous. The prosecution began to prove that something entirely different had happened, the only truthful version. What was credible was injuring and or killing the first child, but being heard by the second, and thereafter finding that, in fact, he had to kill the second child uh, once she was aware of what he had done to the first. A predator who'd been assaulting young girls all of his adult life had struck as the opportunity arose. There was no planning on the part of Huntley in terms of he didn't know that Holly and Jessica were going to arrive that day, but he's already assaulted young girls, so he's, he's rehearsed it behaviourally as well. So this isn't something that comes out of the blue. This is something that's been in the back of his mind, maybe in the forefront of his mind for some time. In the courtroom, Jeremy Thompson saw Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr for the first time since he'd questioned them on television. I was there to confirm the details of the interview I'd done with uh, both Maxine and with Ian Huntley. And I remember looking down at the two of them who were head down, scribbling notes, Maxine Carr biting her fingernails. And I tried to particularly engage Huntley in eye-to-eye -eye contact. It was when I'd interviewed him all those months before, he'd looked me directly in the eye, and as it turned out, lied to his back teeth. Now he was sitting there as the man accused of their murder, refusing to make eye contact with me as I looked down at him. It was accepted that Maxine Carr had nothing to do with the murders, as she was nowhere near so on that day. But she'd provided Huntley with a false alibi and was found guilty of perverting the course of justice. She was given just a three and a half year sentence, of which she served half. She was also acquitted of aiding an offender. It was pretty clear that Maxine Carr was desperately loyal to Huntley and completely in his control, completely in the thrall of Huntley, who was, as it turned out, a sociopathic liar and personality. And history has shown that Ian Huntley was quite a controlling individual, so there might have been all kinds of reasons that Maxine Carr felt under pressure to provide him with that alibi. Um, it means from the court's perspective that they were happy that she didn't know more than she said she did at the time. And we have to go along with the court's decision. Ian Huntley was convicted of murder on both counts and sentenced to a minimum 40 years in jail. But to this day, he has not told the parents or police how he killed Holly and Jessica. Kevin Wells said that he was desperate to know what had happened to his daughter, and Ian Huntley has coldly, calculatedly refused to actually say. Perhaps he feels that anything he does say about the deaths um, will make his time in custody, however long that proves to be, even more unbearable than currently it is. Um, his chance of parole, one anticipates, is exceptionally remote in any event. Perhaps giving an account of what really happened, he feels, can only make matters worse. Few organisations were spared in the fallout from the murders of Holly and Jessica. We've examined our involvement in this case in the minutest detail. Humberside Police admitted it had deleted Huntley's file as a serial sex attacker. The chief constable admitted the force intelligence system had failed almost completely. He took early retirement. Cambridgeshire Police admitted it did not ask for a vetting check on Huntley when he became the college caretaker at Soham. The chief constable was criticised for staying on holiday during the 12-day search for the girls. The head teacher at Soham College admitted he did not follow up any of the four references Huntley had supplied. North East Lincolnshire Social Services admitted it had not passed on to the police a letter from a deputy head raising concerns about Huntley. A government inquiry made 31 recommendations, including a national registration scheme for people who work with children, a new police intelligence system, and training for head teachers and governors on interviewing staff. I think it was probably a watershed moment in educational services that 
they, the one school in one part of the country had no idea that this man had 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 trouble with police in another part of the country and it involved young girls, just the sort of kids he'd be coming into contact with in CERN. But could another Ian Huntley still get through the system? I've no doubt it could. Sadly, I have no doubt another Ian Huntley uh, case could happen again. I just do not believe that whatever reassurances politicians or police or enforcement officers try and give the public that one can ever guarantee that similar events won't happen again. Huntley exploited weaknesses in the system, and according to those who've studied him, he felt invincible. Ian Huntley's history has had episodes of sexual abuse and arrests, which he's managed to escape. He's never been convicted. And uh, this has built his confidence and maybe skills and ability to get away with deception. And that kind of confidence will lead to the pleasure we've seen as a theme through these interviews of feeling pleasure and delight about here I go again and I can fool them again. He's just not really been able to construct anything that's plausible. And to be honest, there's not a lot that is plausible, is there? Because girls don't walk out of their house perfectly healthy one minute and then be dead the next. This is somebody that history has shown got away with lying for a long time and got away with being abusive for a long time. And I think people who get away with that kind of behavior believe they won't be caught. So they have a certain level of confidence when they tell their lies.